Hi, friends. Simit here from InformTrades.com. Today, I wanted to uh, interview Richard Duncan, author of the book The New Depression. That's his latest book. He's also had a number of uh, other books before that. Uh, the book talks a lot about macroeconomics, uh, where the world's headed, the, especially the situation with the dollar and in the U.S. Uh, so I wanted to talk about a bunch of the points uh, in the book uh, and discuss that book with, uh, and thus have a discussion with Richard Duncan about that, the author of the book. Um, it was a really great book. Uh, I think uh, you know, on informed trades, we have a lot of information on Austrian economics. We've talked a lot about this before. The book has uh, a lot of detailed stats in it. Um, Clearly written and outlines, you know, offers one solution uh, or the author's idea for how this mess can be resolved. Um, so I think it's a good read for those who are interested in the subject and really want to to learn the implications, especially the investment implications, pretty deeply. Um, Richard, it's uh, good to have you with us. Hi, Samit. Thank you. It's nice to be with you. Uh, so uh, jumping right into into the conversation about your book. Uh, you know, the first chapter starts uh, with money creation. You know, sort of goes through fractional reserve banking uh, and that whole that whole issue there. How that system works, where you know, money is essentially be created. Banks are loaning out more money than they have. Um, do you view this system as sort of inherently insolvent? Meaning, is fractional reserve banking something that you think works? Um, and if I guess that leads to the question of do we need a new international monetary agreement ultimately? What do you think on that? Do you think a gold standard? Do you, do you like the World Bank IMF idea with the, the SDRs? What are your thoughts on just fractional reserve banking and monetary policy or, or the monetary agreement over where the world is at now? Okay, well I think the real, the real point everyone should grasp is we've had fractional reserve banking for a long time. The thing that change that was so significant was in 1968 Congress changed the law and removed the requirement for the Federal Reserve to maintain any gold backing for the dollars that it issued. So this gold backing had acted as a constraint on how much credit could be created in the, in the system. And after that was removed, credit absolutely exploded in the United States. So total credit and credit and debt are two sides of the same coin. By that I mean government debt, household sector debt, corporate debt, and financial sector debt, all the debt. It first went through one trillion dollars in 1964. And over the following 43 years, it expanded 50 times to 50 trillion, from one to 50 in 43 years. So this explosion of credit, it literally created our world. It made us far more prosperous than we would have been otherwise. And it ushered in the age of globalization, for instance, uh, which was uh, all driven by the U.S. trade deficit, which was financed with U.S. credit denominated in paper money. The problem is, is that now it looks like the credit can't expand anymore because the private sector can't repay the debt that it has already. And if credit now begins to contract, we would experience uh, what the Austrian economists referred to as uh, a depression. And credits, they believe that credit creates an artificial boom. As long as it expands, everyone prospers. But they recognize that the day always comes when it can't expand any further. And when that day comes, all the good things that were going on spiral into reverse and the depression occurs. So that's where we are now. We're teetering on the verge of a collapsing into a new Great Depression after a four and a half, four and a half decade, $50 trillion expansion of credit. And it's only the increase in U.S. government debt that's preventing us from spiraling into this new Great Depression. So, would you think, I mean, would it be fair to say that the dollar has been in a 40-year bubble since 1968 or since the, the gold standard was in 71 was, was fully abandoned? Is that sort of uh, your, your, your look on things? I'm not saying necessarily the dollar has been a bubble, but the, all of the debt denominated in paper dollars has led to a worldwide credit bubble that has been financed and inflated with driven primarily by the United States fifty trillion dollar expansion of debt. But I should point out that it's not only the United States. The similar pattern has occurred in all the major economies around the world. England, France, Germany, Japan, they've all had an explosion of credit for similar reasons. Once the link between money and gold was broken in 1968 or 1971, 
when Bretton Woods broke down, it opened Pandora's box and allowed an explosion of credit to occur globally. Now this multi-decade credit bonanza is verging on collapse. So is your simple take that we just, you know, return to gold? Do you view that as sort of the panacea? Do you like the, the monetary policy, you know, from 1930 to 1971 or, or 68? Do you like that, that era? Um, is that sort of what you think the world needs to return to to solve this? I think if we'd remained on a gold standard, then we wouldn't be now on the verge of economic ruin. But we would all be much poorer than we are as well. We wouldn't have been so materially prosperous. But there's no going back to gold now. We have to live within this world that, where we exist. We can't turn back the clock and make us return to 1968 or 1971. There's no going back. So we have to work with the system that we have now. The system that we have now, I believe, is this isn't a capitalist economy anymore. And in fact, I think the biggest misperception and biggest impediment to overcoming this global economic crisis is the misperception that, we, that we're working within a capitalist economy. This has very, our system has very little in common with capitalism. Capitalism was a 19th century phenomenon uh, in which the government played very little role. Well, in our, in our economy, the U.S. government spends 24% of GDP. That's one dollar out of every four the government spends. And under capitalism, gold was money, and the government didn't have anything to do with it. Well, in our system, the central bank creates the money from thin air and manipulates its value. But perhaps more to my point, under capitalism, the growth dynamic was driven in an entirely different way than it is now. Under capitalism, economic growth occurred like this. Businessmen would invest, some of them would make a profit, they would save that profit, or in other words, accumulate capital, hence capitalism, and repeat, investment, savings, investment, savings. That's how capitalism created economic growth. That's not how our system creates growth. Our system creates growth by credit creation and consumption, and more credit creation and more consumption. And that's created enormously rapid economic growth. The problem is it now looks like this new system, which I call creditism instead of capitalism, is on the verge of collapse because credit can't expand anymore because the private sector can't repay its debts. Is it, um, is it even possible to return to capitalism, though? Or, or you, so you're saying we just need to find a way to make creditism work, and you talk about this, uh, some ideas in the book, and we'll get into that a little bit later. But from your perspective, there's no, there's no going back to capitalism. Is that, is that safe to say? Or? Well, a lot of people seem to have a great nostalgia for capitalism. They seem to think we can take a one or two step steps backward and find ourselves suddenly in some sort of laissez-faire garden of Eden. And they find this very reassuring. But that's just fantasy. There is no going, there's no easy going back. I mean, one way back is we could let the economy collapse and then we would return to sort of the Middle Ages and build up again from the Middle Ages. I mean, after all, when, when Rome fell, when the Roman Empire collapsed, there was a recovery. But it took nine centuries before the Renaissance arrived. We could go back to capitalism that way, but uh, that's not the way I want to go. I think it's far better to work within the system that we have now. Let's just face the facts. We don't have capitalism. We have a government-directed system that's fueled by credit creation. Now, our options are, do we find a way to make this work, or do we let it all collapse and go back to the dark ages? I'm for making it work the way it is now. Okay, um, so in terms of other topics discussed in the book, you know, the first chapter starts with uh, money creation and goes through, provides the reader with a nice overview of fractional reserve banking how that system works, how it expands the money supply. Um, then you sort of talk uh, a little bit more about, you know, how that bad in the fiat money system uh, affects international trade. Um, and one of the ideas I thought was really interesting um, that you note is you don't, or especially because a lot of people have talked about China dumping dollars, dumping treasury bonds, and that resulting in a massive devaluation of the dollar. You find that to be, uh, in the book, you say it's very unlikely because China doesn't want to see uh, the renminbi, you know, go up in value, that that would, you know, pop their bubbles or, or their, their growth cycle. Um, what, do you, what do you think of the role of the renminbi is 
in the international economy. You know, there's a lot of arguments that it's stepping to the forefront, that it's going to displace the dollar in some way. Do you sort of see that, or, or do you think the dollar-based system is 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 in charge? Um, it, I guess where do you see the renminbi in terms of uh, its international future? Okay, well, it's it's very important for everyone to understand exactly how this arrangement works between the United States and China. China has roughly a $300 billion a year trade surplus with the U.S. Okay, so the Chinese manufacturers, they sell their goods in the U.S., they take home $300 billion a year, they want to convert this into the local currency, the renminbi, but if they do that in a free market, buy up $300 billion worth of renminbi, the currency is going to quadruple every year, and that's going to immediately cause China's economy to collapse because their export-led growth would end. So in order to prevent that from happening, China's central bank, the, the PBOC, they buy all the dollars coming into China at a fixed exchange rate. So whoever brings the money in, they get to keep convert their money into the local currency at a fixed exchange rate, so there's no upward pressure on it. And the PBOC ends up with an extra $300 billion every year. But the important thing to understand is, where did the PBOC get $300 billion worth of renminbi that they used last year, for instance, to buy all the $300 billion coming into China? And the answer is, of course, they're a central bank. They have a magic wand. They just wave it around and create this money from thin air. And so that's how China has accumulated $3.2 trillion of foreign exchange reserves. Now, once they have these foreign exchange reserves, they're in dollars. They have a, just a, a number of options as to what they can do with these dollars. They can burn them, they can bury them, or they can buy U.S. dollar-denominated assets with them. And that's what they do. That's what they have done. So they have most of their foreign exchange reserves are in dollars, so they have something like $2.5 trillion worth of U.S. dollar assets of one kind or the other. Now, in order to keep their people employed, they must continue running a very big trade surplus with the United States. And so every year they're going to continue to have not only a very big pile of foreign exchange reserves that they already have, they're going to have an additional flow every year that's going to make their reserves grow higher and higher. And as they grow, they're going to buy more and more U.S. dollar assets of one kind or the other, treasury bonds or asset-backed securities issued by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac corporate debt or stocks or something, because they have to do something with those dollars. And they're not going to dump them, because that would mean that this arrangement would come to an end, and suddenly tens of millions of Chinese factory workers would lose their jobs, and that would cause severe political strains, let's say. I think um, one of the issues that uh, people who... Um do think China's going to run out of the dollar or run out of treasury bonds, one of the things that they sort of see is they see China accumulating gold and silver, buying uranium mines, buying farmland in Africa, uh, seeking to, or at least talking about uh, getting the renminbi incorporated as part of the SDR basket. Uh, do you see that as just incidental, not really, you think people are misinterpreting that as a sign that they're trying to end the relationship with the dollar? Or, or what do you think on China and their, you know, buying up commodities, buying up mines, buying up farmland, uh, do you, you, or that's not really diversifying outside of treasury bonds? Well, no, I think that's a sensible approach for China to use some of these dollars that it accumulates to accumulate other types of assets. And for that matter, one of the reasons they buy so much copper is they'd rather stockpile copper than stockpile U.S. dollar-denominated assets. So that, that makes sense. But you have to understand also that whenever China buys some, some overseas asset, if it pays for it with dollars, then whoever it bought that asset from, those people then have the dollars. And those people then have to buy U.S. dollar assets of one kind or the other, U.S. dollar denominated assets. So just because China sells its dollars doesn't make the dollars go away. It's like farmland. A farmer can sell the farmland, it doesn't disappear, someone else owns it. And so when China diversifies, whoever it buys, if it buys some euros, whoever it buys the euros from, those people have dollars, and they have to buy U.S. dollar-denominated assets. 
So the reason the US dollar, the reason we have a dollar standard, the reason the world functions on dollars is because the United States has such a massive trade deficit. The trade deficit throws dollars off from the global economy, so everyone has dollars. Uh, until China begins to run a massive trade deficit, the, China, the Chinese currency is certainly not going to displace the dollar. Uh, two things would first have to happen. First, China would have to have very large trade deficits, which would throw lots of Chinese renminbi out into the global economy. And then the people accumulating those renminbi would have to have enough confidence in China and in Chinese government bonds and into the stability of China's government in order to invest those renminbi into Chinese currency denominated assets. And I don't think we're, we're not close to seeing either of those criteria being met. Okay, um, moving on to another topic that you talk about in, uh, in chapter three and also later in the book when you're talking about solutions. Um, you know, so you, you acknowledge that, or, you know, the U.S. is in a, <laughs> and the whole world, actually, is in, you know, a really big, big mess here, um, and that w what you view as a solution is for trying to grow your way out of it. For instance, if this additional debt that's undertaken is just used for consumption, um, the book suggests that's not really the path to go. Uh, if the additional debt undertaken is invested in growth, you know, for instance, in the United States, there's uh, infrastructure problems that have been largely documented. You talk a lot about the need for a new energy grid or new, or new energy solutions, and you talk about, you know, investing in solar as a way of, you know, borrowing at low interest rates that will, you know, investing that in real growth and in infrastructure, productivity, um, as a way of growing out of this. Um, now, the U.S. government, as you, as you know, um, you know, has tried, uh, and uh, as is mentioned in the book, has done a fair amount of uh, investing in solar and in some of these uh, new infrastructure type things. Uh, you also mentioned that the return on GDP for additional credit undertaken is declining. So if you look at a long-term chart of, you know, GDP growth per additional dollar of credit, it's a, a downward line. Uh, you know, each each dollar of credit taken is resu resulting in less and less GDP growth. So basically, do you think the U.S. can really grow its way out of it? I mean, what do you think is needed? Do you think, uh, you know, just competent politicians? Is that really what it boils down to? Or or how do you see sort of growing, uh, growing our way out of this, you know, in a world where return on GDP is declining? Um, you know, if you, could, if you could speak a little bit to that. Okay, well, there are really three ways now for us to go forward as a, as a, as a society. There, we have three options. Well, first of all, let me explain. Forecasting macroeconomics is not very, all that complicated. Every, GD, every economy is made up of just four parts. There's private consumption or personal consumption expenditure. That's about 70% of GDP in the U.S. Business investment is about 16% of GDP. Net trade, in other words, exports minus imports, well, that deducts 4% from GDP because we have such a big trade deficit. And the rest, about 20%, is government spending. Okay, so there are three ways for us to go forward. We have three options. The first option is we could do what the Tea Party people say they want us to do and immediately balance the government's budget deficit. Okay, well, so we, we have a $1.1 trillion budget deficit we have a $16 trillion economy. So if you cut the budget deficit by $1.1 trillion, suddenly we have a $14.9 trillion economy overnight. But on top of that, if the government spends a trillion dollars less, 10 million Americans lose their jobs. So consumption also collapses and business investment also collapses and we immediately spiral into a Great Depression. That's the first option. That's the worst possible option. That's called the death today option. Okay. Option number two is to follow the Japan model. Now, Japan's crisis started 22 years ago, and they've had massive government budget deficits every year, almost, for the last 22 years. And they've taken their government debt from 60% of GDP up to 240% of GDP. Okay, that's, that's the Japan model. That's the second option. And that's, what, that's the option that we're pursuing at the moment in the United States and globally. Massive budget deficits are keeping us from collapsing into a depression. We can do this for a number of more years, somewhere between five to ten more years, I guess, 
and then will collapse into a new Great Depression. In about 10 years, the U.S. government will be as bankrupt as Greece, and then will collapse into a new Great Depression. Okay, so that's option two. That's far, far better than option one. It's a whole lot better to die 10 years from now than to die today. So that's the death in a decade model. And that's the model that we're currently pursuing. And honestly, that's the, that's the model that we're most likely to continue to pursue. But there is a far better option, option number three. We need to learn from Japan's mistakes. If the Japanese had understood in 1990 that their crisis was going to go on for more than a quarter of a century, they would not have wasted all of this money that they've spent building bridges to nowhere and paving the Japanese countryside with cement. They would have come up with an absolutely brilliant plan on how to invest trillions of dollars in cutting edge technologies. And if they'd done that, they would now be the global economic superpower. But they didn't. They wasted all the money. And so this is what we have to learn. Our crisis is not going to end in a couple of years. This is going to go on for decades. And we can do what Japan has done, and spend trillions of dollars propping up the economy wastefully, spending it on too much consumption and war, or we can invest the money in cutting edge 21st century industries and technologies. So what I'd like to see is for the US government over the next 10 years to invest a trillion dollars in solar energy, a trillion dollars in genetic engineering, a trillion dollars in biotechnology, and a trillion dollars in nanotechnology. And if they do that, we will have an absolutely unassailable lead in 21st century industries. And we could lock in another American century. And I'm not talking about investing in solar panel companies. I'm talking about carpeting Nevada with hundreds of thousands of American-made solar panels and building a grid coast to coast to transmit the electricity on and developing batteries that make automobiles go 70 miles an hour as long as you want and completely transitioning the automobile industry from being gasoline burning to being electric fuel. And then in 10 years from now, we would have free eternal limitless energy and the cost of energy to the private sector would collapse. Then the government could tax the domestically generated electricity and earn enough money to, for instance, pay for Medicare for the next 10,000 years. If the government invests a trillion dollars in genetic engineering and biotechnology, they're going to come up with miracles like a cancer vaccine or even something like a molecular therapy that reverses aging, which they supposedly already have in mice. So as soon as the government starts selling a cancer vaccine, not only are we going to balance that year's budget deficit, we're going to completely pay off the national debt in a very short period of time. So this is not only a, the reason creditism, now everyone can see the flaws with creditism. All the credit keeps blowing up, but we are overlooking the opportunities that exist within this new economic system of ours. And the opportunity is that our government can borrow trillions and trillions of dollars at 1.6% interest. Nothing like this has ever occurred in history before. This is not just a once in a lifetime opportunity. This is once in history opportunity. Up until now, all throughout history, this sort of government borrowing and spending and paper money creation would have led to very high rates of inflation a long time ago. The reason it hasn't is because something completely separate is going on, and that's globalization. Because of globalization, globalization is driving down the cost of wages. You no longer have to pay someone $200 a day in Michigan to build a car. You can pay someone $5 a day in India to do that. And so this represents a 95% drop in the marginal cost of labor. This is extremely deflationary. And this extreme deflationary pressure is completely offsetting the high inflationary pressure caused by the credit creation and paper money creation. So for a short period of time, we're living in a kind of nirvana world where the government can borrow and spend trillions of dollars and borrow it at 1.6% interest. So if they borrow this money and invest it aggressively, and wisely in transformative industries, then we can completely avoid ever collapsing into a new depression. In fact, we can induce a new technological revolution that would improve the well-being of everyone on this planet. Do you, um, it sounds, and correct me if I'm wrong, it sounds a little bit like, uh, or what do you think of the policies that were undertaken during the Great Depression in the 30s, where there was a lot of 
you know, under FDR's rule in the U.S. or presidency in the U.S., uh, there was a lot of spending in infrastructure. Do you think that's sort of like a, a new type of New Deal? Is, is that a fair way to describe what you're talking about? Well, no, I'm not really talking about patching up the roads and bridges and, and painting the courthouse with art, new, art Deco art. I'm talking about investing in transformative, cutting-edge technologies that would generate such a massive investment return that they would pay for themselves many, many times over and completely transform our economy and restore its economic viability. Okay, um, moving on to, uh, to where we're at now. Um, so, you know, as you know, or as uh, basically anyone following financial markets knows, the Federal Reserve recently announced QE3, which is an open-ended program, basically QE till forever, and eternity. Um, I guess, you know, one common concern there is that the Fed is going to really stoke a lot of inflation with this policy. Um, do you sort of see that? Can you speak a little bit to that in terms of, you know, the counter argument is that the Fed cannot enforce inflation. Do you view, you know, the Fed absolutely can enforce it if it's sufficiently determined? Some people say they, they don't control bank loans, uh, which is the bizarre majority of money creation. Uh, they also don't control velocity. They just sort of control the base. Um, so can they really, will QE3 or open-ended QE invariably result in inflation? Um, and another point related to that that I thought was really interesting in the book is, you know, you sort of outline, you know, you do call the sections fire and ice, you know, inflation versus deflation sort of. And you talk about how if CPI goes above 4%, stocks won't be a good environment. Um, I thought if you could uh, shed some insight on that and, and why uh, or how you came to that 4% that mark for, for stocks being a, a pain point um, when CPI reaches that level. Okay, I don't think the goal of quantitative easing is to create inflation. I think it's to prevent deflation. I think it's useful to think of the global economy as being a big rubber raft. But this raft, instead of being inflated with air, has been inflated with credit. And on top of this rubber raft, on top of our global economy, float all of the assets, stocks, bonds, commodities, including gold, real estate, and the 7 billion people. The problem is, is now the raft is fundamentally defective and it is full of holes and the credit keeps leaking out all the sides of the holes of the raft. As people default on their debt, the credit leaks out the sides of the holes and the raft starts to sink. So the natural tendency of the raft is to sink and when it sinks, then all the assets lose value and if it sinks too far, people are going to begin to die, just like they did in the 1930s and 1940s. So the reason the raft is fundamentally flawed now is that so much credit has been created globally that the income of the 7 billion people is simply insufficient to service the interest on so much debt. So they keep defaulting. And the credit keeps getting destroyed, it leaks out the side of the raft, and so the raft sinks. Its natural tendency is to deflate. And that dictates the policy response. There's only one possible policy response to keep the raft from going down, and that is to pump in more credit. And that's what QE is all about. When the Fed creates more money and pumps it into the raft, it reflates the raft, and it, keeps, it makes the asset prices go up, and it keeps the people safe and dry. Now, the policymakers are absolutely terrified that this is going to lead to a replay of the, of the 1930s and 1940s. And they're very right to be concerned because these two crises came about in the same way. The Great Depression originated in the 1930s. I'm sorry, originated in 1914 when World War I started. At that time, all the European countries went to war. They didn't have enough gold to fight the war, so they started issuing a lot of paper money and a lot of government debt, and that was the end of the classical gold standard. And all the paper money and all the debt created by the government during the World War I that led to a worldwide credit bubble that we call the Roaring Twenties. They say that was fun, but in 1930, the credit couldn't be repaid. And the international banking system collapsed, and global trade collapsed, and policymakers didn't know what to do. They believed in market forces and laissez-faire, so they just stepped back and let market forces work. And market forces, of course, did work, and market forces established a new equilibrium Unfortunately, that equilibrium was at a level of GDP that was 46 
46% less than it had been in 1929, and at a level of unemployment that ranged from 15% to 25% in the U.S. for a decade, a decade during which Germany turned fascist and took over Europe, and Japan turned fascist and took over Asia, and then the war started, and 60 million people died. And when the war started, the U.S. government then, in, then increased its spending by 900 percent. And that increase in government spending into the Depression, but the war killed 60 million people. Well, this time the pattern's been exactly the same. The Bretton Woods system, up until the policy response, the Bretton Woods system broke down in 1971. Afterwards, government started issuing enormous amounts of government debt and increasing amounts of paper money. And that's led to a four and a half decade global economic boom that we've enjoyed all of our lives. But in 2008, the credit couldn't be repaid. And the international banking system started to collapse and global trade started to collapse. But this time, rather than let market forces work, policymakers are determined to prevent that from happening again, because they're afraid that it would mean a 30 or 40 percent contraction in global GDP with horrific geopolitical consequences. And that's what QE is all about is to prevent deflation, a deflationary death spiral that would occur in its absence. And that's, that's what they're doing, that's what they're going to continue to do because that's the only policy option that they have. Uh, do you think, so you don't think, you don't think it'll result in inflation? I mean, I know you're saying that it will, that the idea or the goal is to prevent deflation. Um, and it, I'm, it seems like you're, you believe it will prevent deflation will prevent a repeat of the 1930s scenario. Um, do you think that it will result in significant inflation or, or it'll just sort of, we'll, we'll be at a, a no, no inflation, no real decline in GDP either? Well, for quite some time now, we've been in a kind of Goldilocks land again where there's very relatively low rates of CPI inflation if you strip out food and energy. And so, if they turn off the taps and stop QE, then very quickly we'll move into deflation. So they, they believe that they have to create enough paper money so, so that that doesn't occur. Now we're in very uncharted territory. It's, we've never been in a world like this before, so it's not certain how long this is going to work. I think the major flaw with quantitative easing, you know, how, how great it would be without this flaw, print money, push the stocks up, everybody's richer, and we all live happily ever after. It sounds great. Well, there's one big problem. It creates extreme food price inflation, or, or at least the second round of QE did. During the second round of QE, global food prices went up 60%, and that created a humanitarian disaster because two billion people on Earth live on less than $2 a day. These people were hungry to start with. They became hungrier. Some of them started rioting and overthrowing their governments in North Africa and around the Middle East. So QE was the spark that ignited the Arab Spring. It was about rising food prices to begin with. That was the thing that really tipped the scale. So now I'm a bit surprised that they, the Fed has gone ahead and launched this next round of quantitative easing at this time because the drought in the United States has already driven up corn and soybean prices to near record high levels. If we have 40 billion or more of paper money creation a month for the next 12 months, 24 months, 36 months, then this is going to drive food prices much higher. And this is going to create more hunger and more, perhaps more hunger inspired revolutions. These could spread not only around the Middle East, but east into Pakistan. India, even China, Vietnam, Indonesia, basically everywhere there are poor people. And so that's the problem of QE. And that's it's not the CPI, X food and energy level that we have to worry about. It's the food price inflation and how that's going to impact the two billion people on earth who are living on less than two dollars a day and and already hungry. So you don't think uh not counting food and energy, you you, you you don't think CPI will will really go. I know it's open-ended, and we're or we don't we're in uncharted territory, so it's hard to 
know really what's going to happen. But in terms of at least as, as best as one can sort of make a hypothesis, you're not expecting CPI not including food and uh, or and energy to go to go much higher. You think it'll be we'll stay in this this realm Goldilocks land like you had referred to it. We're not really it's not really going up. It's not really going down. Well, that's what they're trying to achieve. Uh, I certainly wish them luck, but it's hard to say. You know, if we fall off the fiscal cliff, then that's going to ensure the U.S. goes into a severe recession, and that's going to ensure, ensure the world goes into a severe recession, and that's going to be extremely deflationary. However, if we have a war with, with Iran, and oil goes to $300 a barrel, and we spend an extra 2 or $3 trillion in the Middle East and more, then that's going to be very inflationary. So you tell me which of those scenarios is going to be the one that plays out, and I'll tell you whether we have inflation or deflation. It depends um, on the policy. In terms of, okay, so for the, you know, average individual out there who is in this environment and, you know, really might not sure, isn't sure how to make sense of it, um, is not a professional speculator, is not actively trading, is just sort of looking for a way to, to hold their, their wealth, a safe place to put their money, or maybe some growth opportunities if they can that are, that are reasonably uh, safe. Um, what do you think are some good ideas? Do you, do you favor gold? Do you think uh, bonds, dividend stocks? What, what are some thoughts there? Okay, so the, the hard truth is that it's very hard to preserve wealth. If it were easy to preserve wealth, the families who were rich 200 years ago would still be rich today, and most of them are not. And in the sort of environment that we're likely to face over the next 10 to 20 years, it seems quite probable that a great deal of wealth is going to be destroyed. So keeping that in mind, I do think that there are some things that individuals can do to protect themselves over the next 5 to 10 years before, before this big meltdown really does become much more fierce. And I think one is to accumulate a portfolio of rental property. In the United States, property prices have already fallen 30, 34% on average across the country. So it's much, much safer, I would say, to buy somewhere where prices have fallen so much than, for instance, in London or Hong Kong or Singapore where they've been skyrocketing and are still very high. So if you can accumulate a portfolio of rental property, then all right, if we have a deflationary collapse, then your property values are going to go down and your rents are going to go down. But the cost of everything else is going to go down as well. And so you'll still be relatively as well off or better off, and you'll still have some cash flow coming in every month. But the trick is, is you have to, if you're going to finance with this with credit, then you need to borrow at fixed interest rates, which are extremely low, and lock in the low fixed interest rates. And that way, if we do end up with high rates of inflation, that's going to cause your, your debt to evaporate. And the other thing is you have to keep a very prudent balance, I would say, in how much credit you actually use to finance the purchases of your rental property. Because when the crash comes, if, it, if, it, if a deflationary crash occurs, then your rents will drop and you may not have the income to service the interest on your mortgage and the bank will take your house away from you. But keeping those two considerations in mind, I think developing a portfolio of rental property over the next five to ten years and developing a stream of cash flow uh, for you into the future, something, a real asset that you can hold on to and ensure is not going to evaporate through some corporate scandal, perhaps involving derivatives manipulation, something real and something you can control, I think real estate is a good investment. What about um, things like uh, real estate investment trusts or, or dividend stocks that could also provide an income stream? Do you think they're still too, too financialized, so to speak, too close to, to you know, derivatives or, or paper securities uh, relative to, to rental real estate? I do think so. I mean, you were saying these are people who are not sophisticated investors. To, to, know, what are, to, know, to know what these REITs are actually made up of, you, you have to do a lot of work. And, and honestly, who knows? Some, are, I'm sure, are very highest quality and some are of the lowest quality. But if you want to know what your real estate portfolio is comprised of, then you buy the real estate yourself and own it. And then you'll know. For um, 
there, there's also the viewpoint that uh, the QE and uh, this type of aggressive monetary policy by the Fed is going to result in bubbles or a series of bubbles. You know, they'll attribute that the the dot com bubble and even the housing bubble were a result of uh, really low interest rates and that type of inflationary monetary policy. Do you share that view? Do you think open ended QE is going to result in a series of bubbles? Um, do you think for for a speculator who may be interested in that opportunity, do you think do you think that makes sense where we're at now? Well again I'd I'd like to bring this all back to the total credit number that I've been talking about, the one that went from $1 trillion to $50 trillion. It's now roughly $55 trillion. And it's, it wasn't the, the Fed actually printing money that made the credit grow to that amount. Of course, the low interest rates facilitated the expansion of credit. So looking forward, whether or not we have credit, whether or not we have bubbles or not, is going to depend on whether the credit expands. If the credit expands very rapidly again, and yes, we're going to have a series of new bubbles. If the credit contracts, for instance, because the government cuts its government spending and cuts its budget deficits, then credit will contract, and we not only will we not have bubbles, our global wrath will sink and we'll have deflation. Uh, deflation not only in CPI, but in, across the spectrum of asset classes as well. Every, if we have a deflationary depression, then the value of all assets will drop. Even I hate to say the value of gold. Okay, um, I think that's uh, that's about it in terms of what we have uh, on schedule. Um, Richard, your book is uh, the New Depression. I really uh, thought it was a great book. I encourage people to check it out. For people that want to follow you, what's uh, what's the website they can uh, follow you at? I have a, a website and a blog. The address is richardduncaneconomics.com. It's no spaces, richardduncaneconomics.com. Uh, you can sign up for my blog. It's free, and um, that's the best way to follow me. Okay, so uh, richardduncaneconomics.com. The book is The New Depression. Uh, thanks a lot, Richard, for, uh, for taking time out of your day to, uh, to speak with us. Well, thank you. And let me just end on a more of a cheerful note here. Sure. I know <laughs> what I'm saying sounds very gloomy, and, and it's true. We're living in a, a very precarious situation. Uh, but as far as I can see, there's no reason the government can't continue supporting us as it has been doing for the last four years and as Japan's government has been doing for nearly a quarter of a century. There's no realistic reason or no rational reason why the government can't continue doing this with very little difficulty for the next five years. Again, look, the government's debt is only 100 percent of GDP. Japan's is 240. U.S. Can, government can borrow at 1.6 percent. So to end on a happy note here, the, the happy note is, is for the next five years you have absolutely nothing to worry about. Eat, drink, and be merry. The government is supporting you and they're going to continue to support you. So do not despair. And in the meantime, we have this five to ten year window of opportunity to actually end, come to grips with and understand this, the nature of this economic crisis that we have and the nature of our new economic system, creditism, and to understand the opportunities that it presents to us as a democratic society, and to grasp those opportunities, and to invest this credit in a way that staves off the crisis forever and induces a technological revolution that results in us all being far better off uh, for decades to come. So do not despair. Yeah, that's definitely a good uh, a good way to conclude. We do have, uh, I think that makes a lot of sense, we do have some time to, to get things right, fix this uh, situation, uh, which is often a point that's uh, overlooked by the people who are focusing on this problem. Um, so thanks a lot for joining us, Richard. Once again, the website is richardduncaneconomics.com. The book is The New Depression. Uh, thanks a lot, Richard. Take care. Thank you. Good night.